in Republican Imperial Rome. Thank you very much. Uh, the subject of my paper is the issue of abuse in the field of using water supplied to Rome by aqueducts. But at the beginning, I would like to introduce you into this th uh, theme. So firstly, however, in my researches, I focus attention only on the city of Rome. Now first, with high probability, um, it might be said that the same phenomenon occurred also in other cities, in other cities of Roman Republic and also in the time of empire. Secondly, to be aware of the essence of the problem as well as the scale of water frauds, it is worth just to, for a moment focus on, on the question concerning the engineering and statistical data, but just, just for a moment. So for the first 400 years after the founding of Rome, it was supplied with water only by the surrounding springs, wells, and Tiber, and it was enough because at the time Tiber was not so polluted like uh, as, uh, later. Development of the city as well as the constant influx of its inhabitants caused the necessity to search new solutions in the field of uh, water, especially drinking water supplies. The breakthrough moment fell on the year 312 before Christ, when the first aqueduct to the city of Rome was built. Uh, the initiator of this undertaking was Caesar Appius Claudius Secus. Um, we may call him the builder of, of one of the, of the first and one of the most important aqueducts uh, called after him uh, Aqua Appia. He was also the builder of Via Appia, one of the biggest, longest and also the most important Mm, roads in, uh, in Rome called also Regina Viaro. Uh, by the end of the uh, Republic, another four aqueducts were built while in the Empire VI. Eventually, mm, during the reign of Alexander Sever in the second half of the third century, Rome in total was supplied by 11 aqueducts with the full capacity of approximately 368 million cubic meters. Along with the increase of the number of aqueducts, as well as uh, water, which was supplied to the city, uh, also the, the, the number of cases of theft was growing. And the question on uh, which I will try to find the answer, um, there generally there are three questions. Uh, who committed those thefts, how they were committed, and finally, on what scale. Fortunately, the, uh, finding the answer is not so hard, thanks to Frontinus uh, and his treatise entitled The Aqueductu Urbis Rome. Uh, this work is really crucial for uh, researchers on the water supply in ancient Rome, especially ancient, in ancient world, especially in ancient uh, Rome. During the reign of Emperor Nerva, he reigned between six, uh, 96 and 98, Frontinus held the office of Curator Aquarum, uh, and uh, that's why he was responsible for the administration, maintenance, uh, management of, uh, of water, water supplies, uh, but only within, within the capital. Uh, therefore, in his treatise, Frontinus published uh, fortunately for us, uh, published the results of his measurements and many other uh, considerations. Uh, he also quoted the contents of legal regulations in force in the field of administration of public work, waters and other very many statistical uh, data important for uh, contemporary researchers, so for us today. And now I would like to focus our attention on uh, three points. First of all, uh, crimes committed by private individuals, but later I will, you will show that this is really hard to distinguish, uh, to divide the thefts uh, into two groups, uh, the one which we can call private individuals and the second um, public officials, functioners, because you will see that those crimes were really connected because the, the, the thefts the thefts themselves were um, collaborating. Mm, so among the first group of water thieves, we may rate the inhabitant of, of the city of Rome. Uh, one of the most frequent and common water crimes committed by them uh, was the pipe perforation. And uh, Frontinus described it in 
in the fragment d'Aqueducto 115, which is on your uh, papers. Uh, it consists in drilling holes in the pipes and placing the smaller uh, pipes within. Uh, I will not describe this procedure because this is a little complicated and this is not the point of my uh, uh, statement, but in general it looked like this. Uh, stolen water served, among others, to irrigate fields, uh, shops, taverns and, as Frontino says, also brothels. In the second place, thefts were committed by the concessioners. Uh, between concessioners, we may uh, show uh, principes civitatis, baths and fullers. And of course, they are owners, not the bath and fuller itself, but, but the, they are owners. On the basis of a special consent called Jus Impetrate Acve, which today in many countries we just call concession, water concession, uh, they could receive water directly to their homesteads or working places, so to the baths and, <coughs> and fullers. Uh, in the time of uh, Republic, concession was granted by censors, sometimes by uh, cruel edils, but only uh, if uh, there was no censor. If censor couldn't do it, so the, then the, uh, uh, if the censor couldn't do it, uh, then um, the Elio did it, uh, and in the time of empire, only um, the emperor, uh, first emperor who reserved this right for him, was uh, was the first emperor Augustus. Thus, the offense, the water offenses of the concessioners uh, consisted on installing uh, illegal connections with the water pipes and changing the special instrument uh, for measuring, they were called uh, calices, which were placed in the reservoirs, which were called uh, castella. The, the biggest one was Castellum Divisorium, and there were also smaller in many cities, not only in Rome, of course. They were called just uh, uh, castella. Uh, legal calices were changed for calices of bigger diameter or were connected in the wrong way or on the wrong height. And this was very dangerous because it led to adverse reduction of water pressure. Sometimes calices weren't registered at all. And this fraud caused uh, double uh, adverse consequences. Firstly, uh, brought about damage on the field of water distribution because water flew faster and in consequence in bigger amounts. And it meant that in, um, the private individual received just much more water than he should according to the concession that was granted to him. And secondly, it hindered to even render impossible to bring the paper traitor to justice. Eventually, in many cases, they remained undetected. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, and you will see in, in a moment, that this is really hard, that this is not hard to see that all those water thefts wouldn't have taken place if it hadn't been for the help of the public uh, fu uh, functionaries, especially in the time of Roman Empire. Since this were they who had, the, first of all, proper access to these installations and to proper, the proper knowledge. Uh, so it may be presumed that such calices were installed for convenience, as Frontinus says, because he calls it convenience, of the responsible officials. Finally, there were also cases that stamp jets were attached to pipes with the caliber bigger than it was permitted. Uh, there was one more phenomenon that should be classified as the water offense. It was the intentional deterioration, as Frontino said, dolo malo, uh, so the intentional deterioration of its quality and uh, especially its pollution. Uh, this phenomenon, the Romans and also Frontinus called uh, oletare aquam. We can say that it means polluted or making the water smelly, but this is the same. Uh, because the, uh, the consequence of this uh, crime was that water uh, was not drinking water anymore. Uh, it's also uh, such uh, such crime, uh, such an act was forbidden under the penalty of fine, as usual. But this time, 
in the amount of 10,000 sesterces, so very big amount. It's worth to emphasize that it was a steady punishment, uh, which means that its height didn't depend neither on the quality of the polluted water nor on its capability for drinking. It was steady. Uh, we may assume that the offense called Oletare Aquam consider, uh, considered each deterioration of water quality delivered to Rome independently of its initial quality and purpose, but it was, um, uh, but it had to be done dolo malo. This was the only uh, condition. The mere fact that a private individual harmed the public use was enough to recognize such an act as a crime. And now a few words about the offenses committed by the public officials, functionaries, it depends if we are in Roman Republic or later in, in the Empire. Mainly, again, thanks to Frontinos, we know that in the cr water crimes there were also implicated those persons whose duty was to ensure water and to save it. Thus, it's beyond doubt that these persons were public officials. Uh, moreover, it's noticeable that offenses of the public functions were closely connected with crimes committed by private individuals, by the inhabitants of, of the city. Uh, only, as I said uh, uh, earlier, uh, only with the help of these functions it was possible to, first of all, install bigger calices and lead more water to a given recipient. Then it followed from the contents of uh, used in Petrate Aqua, so uh, from the contents of uh, their concession, the concession that was granted uh, to them. Uh, who committed those thefts? Um, uh, according to Frontinos, these weren't the uh, curatores aquari, uh, but these were procuratores. Uh, this is on, they were on the first, uh, on the first uh, step. Uh, they were in charge of the technical supervision of the use of public water. Um, their duty was to stamp the public installation that supplied water to private inhabitants and control the manner of implementation of them of their rights, by them of their rights. Uh, that is why every time a private person was granted a concession, it was the duty of a procurator procurator to mark the said calyx and supervise its measurement as well as its location. This is in the text 105 from Frontinus de Aqueduct. Yet Frontinus wrote that activity of procurators was contrary to their duties. It's, it's rather obvious. First of all, they installed and stamped the calyxes even though they were much bigger then they should be according to the concession of a private individual. And sometimes they even didn't stamp them at all. It, wasn't, it was nothing so surprising. Uh, a direct consequence of such activities was a growing number of the illegal recipients and illegal connections to the pipes uh, that supplied uh, water. Uh, but the procurator were not the only public, public services liable for the water supply who perpetrated frauds. In the time of empire, uh, there were also aquari, uh, which means watermen, vilices, which means overseers, and libratores, so plumbers. Uh, the essence of the watermen crimes consisted in fixing pipes with defectively fitted calices. Such a practice caused lowering of water pressure, which in turn caused reduction of water supplies in general. Uh, but the worst was that aquari, mm, watermen, aquari, fixed pipes which didn't have any calices at all, and conse consequently they were able to change size of the pipes. Another offense mentioned by Frontinus, committed by, by them, by aquari, was connected with their participation in the uh, concession procedure because this procedure changed uh, just mm, I, I, during the reign of, of the first Emperor Augustus. Uh, I mean to say that uh, each change of the landowner caused either by his death or an illegal act, for example, an alienation of the real estate, 
led to expiry of the concession. It was said then that the concession is vacant. So if a new owner was interested in obtaining a new concession, he had to turn for it in his own name and he was given or he was granted or, 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 or not granted. Initially, there was a rule according to which, in the same moment when concession became vacant, the water supply to an exact estate was cut off. It means that till the moment of granting concession to a new owner, the real estate was deprived of water. Admittedly, such a person could have used it, but only for a fee. Since the reign of Nero, there was a principle according to which in this period, between expiration of the previous concession and granting a new one so jointly for uh, 30 days, maximum 30 days, the possessor of the ground could uh, use uh, water. The moment of granting this right to the new owner of a real estate was exercised by Akfari, who at this occasion committed another fraud. Water concession, uh, because it was quite a long process, so water concession was being transferred to the new processor, uh, and then Akfari installed another outlet inside the Castellum. The Castellum, as I said before, is a reservoir, and sold the old one. So um, there were two uh, outlets for one uh, uh, for one real estate, the previous one and the new one. Furthermore, the officials made perforations of the underground pipes, so the same uh, crime which uh, the private individuals committed. As a result of this, only a little quantity of water flew, flew to the spaces uh, between others to public fountains, which was very important for all the habitants. And now something, some, a few words about, about liberatores, plumbers. Most probably, because we don't know mm, about them, mm, we don't have any, m many informations about them, most probably they were responsible for marking out uh, the, the roots of the pipelines from the reservoirs, these bigger ones, Castella Divisoria, up to the point of destination of the water supplies. Uh, they, were, mm, they were obliged to measure the instrument and their installations. And as Frontinos informs us, rather often did they take the opportunity to install bigger calices that it was admissible. It is characteristic and worth to stress that Libratores installed the calices on demand of procurators. Uh, only uh, one, may, one may notice a kind of a collaboration between procurators and plumbers, so there was collaboration between um, uh, the officials and, uh, and also uh, officials and private uh, individuals. Frontinus, who described this phenomenon bluntly, uh, called it greed and uh, negligence. Uh, as regards Belitzes, overseers, probably one of the bigger crimes they committed consisted on grounding authorization for installing unstepped uh, jets in the reservoirs, but we don't know too, many about, too much about them. And the last point of my statement are the methods of preventing the public water thefts. And at the very beginning, we have to emphasize that Romans did not have any special prevent preventives against the abuse on the field of water supply of Rome. Nonetheless, um, there were some measures which at least a part of them uh, could be named preventive. One of them was the penalty of fine. So for stealing water, mm, there was fine. Uh, for example, the one I said before in the amount of 10,000 uh, sesterces. Uh, also, the number of technical solutions, uh, the measure of, of calices, for example, it also serves as a protection against thefts of water. Uh, these regulations, in turn, determine the, quality, the quantity and also the quality uh, and speed of water flowing inside them. In addition, they facilitated the constant control of its level. In the time of Republic, it was, uh, there was a practice that also the private citizens watched over 
the proper use of water resources and uh, even though Frontinos lived uh, later, he described this, uh, how it looked like, and we have it in his treatise uh, 97. Uh, he explained that in the city of Rome, it, it, its inhabitants, uh, under the command of cruel Edil, created a kind of something that we could call a civic guard. Its functioning was quite simple, since it, in each district, Adults choose two persons, uh, just the inhabitants. So two persons whose task was to supervise, administer a water flowing in the public spaces. So they were responsible for fountains in their district. Also the strict rules concerning concessions might be numbered among the measures of protection against the abuses. So finally, we could say that um, we, we could emphasize that they could have allowed themselves to lead public water to their homestead only on the basis of the use impetrate acfe, which means concession, granted by a proper administrative organ, and solely in the indicated places. Drawing water in other places were strictly, strictly forbidden. And just to sum up, uh, we come to the few Conclusions. First of all, it is noticeable that the scale of routes within uh, Rome and I suppose it also in other cities of, of the Roman Empire uh, increased uh, as the years went by. It means that in the Principate uh, the cases of theft occur, occurred more often than in the time of Republic and the reasons of this seems to be obvious of course. First, since the second uh, century before Christ, there was noted a steady increase of population settling down in, in Rome, and this in turn was ambiguous with the increase of the water consumers, so more water was supplied to Rome. Secondly, during the principate building works related to the aqueducts were intensified. Um, the princeps had it own, his own fiscal caesaris, so he had enough money to build new aqueducts. Uh, furthermore, attention is attracted by the variety of ways of committing a public water theft, as well as the wide range of persons engaged, especially cura curatores aquarum, procuratores, and other uh, uh, auxiliary, auxiliary staff. Uh, however, it's hard to unambiguously estimate the scale of the problem of abusing the public water, yet thanks to Frontinus, uh, Frontinus and his, his record, we may assume that during the time of a Republic, as well as in Principate, but especially in this period, uh, Rome struggled with an epidemic of water fronts. Thank you very much.